I said to the first people that came in that this was going to be very informal. I didn't present, uh, develop a presentation particularly. I just sort of uh, thought back over the last six or seven months of, of my life involved with this uh, Audubon Gallery. Um, I thought I'd start with a little history of how it came to be. You've all seen it, so uh, let me just say that uh, the way I expect to make this presentation is just to talk for a while until you start nodding off, and then invite you all to go out to the actual gallery. We can walk and we can look at the various pictures. There's something interesting to say about almost each one of them, or you might have questions at that point, too. But I'm also open to questions anytime during this part of the presentation, or comments also. Many of you probably know more about Audubon than I do, since it's a recent interest of mine. It all started when I was, well, I live in Manly, it's not in the village, but in the town. And it all started when I just thought one day when I was here at the library, wouldn't it be nice if there was a picture of a swan in the library? The library is right next to the swan pond. The swan is the symbol of Manlius and so on. And uh, so I looked around a bit and I thought, well, the logical person to do a nice swan would be Audubon. So I checked on Audubon and found out that he had actually done three pictures of swans. And I looked around in the library. I didn't really see any good place for three big pictures of swans. But what is now the teen room next door, where they used to have a silent room, you could look at magazines and sit in nice leather chairs, they had walls in there that I thought were suitable. And so I approached the then director of the library about a year and a half ago and uh, asked if he thought the library would be interested. And he said that they were very much involved in this redesigning and replanning project that they're ongoing now, but that really culminated in the uh, October 17th centennial event uh, a few months ago. And so they, he didn't think they really had time to consider trying to work this into their plans. Uh, but he was interested and he would get back to me, but he never got back to me. So who, was, he, who was he? I thought he had him for it, it, so. no, it was Matt, what, what was his last name? Do you remember? Delaney. Matt Delaney? Delaney. 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 Delaney, that's right. Delaney. I, I forgot his last name, Matt Delaney. Delaney. And uh, so I came by the library just about uh, maybe in just June of this year. Oh. And uh, said, you know, I hadn't heard back and I wondered what was going on. And they mentioned that uh, he had moved on to better things. There, were, there was an interim director and that the new permanent director would be coming in later in the summer. Well, the interim director is, uh, is uh, Kirsten Spina, who is the business manager, and she was very nice, and she very much liked the project when I outlined it to her. Um, but she mentioned that as part of this reorganization of the library, they were going to change the reading room next door into this teen room. And they were going to move some things uh, in the main area that had all of the stacks for the uh, CDs and the uh, TV uh, digital materials away from where it was. And they were going to move the nice parts of the reading room out there, the leather chairs, the stickly looking, oh, stickly, I don't know whether it's real stickly oh, it's real. or not, <laughs> real stickly <laughs> furniture. And that would open up this wonderful 34 foot long brick wall. And my eyes just popped. I thought, no. Brick wall right in the middle of the library, lots of room, no need to just, just limit it to three birds. We could do something really grand. So I started thinking, and I finally, my ultimate scheme was to propose to the library that we use that brick wall and actually a little bit of it around the corner uh, for an Audubon gallery. It would have certain limitations. All the birds would be local birds. So that excluded some of Audubon's most famous birds, but he had something like 435 different species in his prints. So you have to limit them one way or another. So I decided to go with local birds, highlight the swans, all three swans. And in the second edition of the birds was a much smaller edition. So if you look out there, you'll see there's three little pictures. So I just decided to double the birds, uh, the swans for that, so that we really have an emphasis on swans. So the same swans that are in the large size are out there in the second edition in the small size with slight variations, which is another reason why I did that, so people could make a comparison between the first edition and the, and the second edition. The other factors that I took wanted to take into account were 
beauty and popularity. All the pictures out there are among the 30 or 40 most famous or most popular pictures that Audubon did of his 400 and some odd. Uh, secondly, I wanted not just a bunch of pictures, but I wanted something that had cultural and historical uh, interest. So only a small number of the pictures out there are reproductions, and they're reproductions for very specific reasons. But most of the pictures are original, authentic works from editions that were either done, uh, done by Audubon or his family, or in one particular case, what they call a restrike edition that I'll talk about. Um, so you get bird prints out there that were be being produced between 1826 and last year, but most of them in the 19th century. And they represent four, the four most important, or the four major editions of Audubon in terms of value because of their historicity and the hands-on activities of the Audubon people themselves working on it and so forth. So anyone wanting to study the history of bird print reproduction during the 19th and 20th century, that's one way they could take an approach to look at these materials. Um, the other factor I wanted to take in, into account was simply how would the library use the gallery? The gallery could be used for these kinds of purposes that we've talked about. But there's lots of other, this, this library is famous for supporting children and teens and all kinds of adult activities. And there's many ways you could think of this gallery being useful in the cultural and in a fun type way too. I just met somebody who mentioned that she used to live practically next door to the, to the Cornell Ornithological um, Institute or department. Or, and you could easily imagine inviting somebody up from time to time to talk in detail about one or two of the birds or some aspect of, of it. And um, histor historically, as uh, Claire mentioned at the beginning, I think, or maybe you also mentioned, you mentioned, uh, I think, that uh, you liked Audubon himself. Audubon is a fascinating um, figure in American history. Um, he was known as the American woodsman in, in Europe. And very handsome, beloved of a lot of women, an amazing man, full of energy and talent, and, uh, and a great painter as well as a great uh, naturalist. So sort of an amazing combination of features all into this one person who was born, in, uh, by the way, in Haiti and moved to the United States because of slave uh, rebellion problems in Haiti and came to the, uh, New York in, when he was 18 years old and immediately came down with yellow fever. And he was nursed back to health in a Quaker hospital, and it was, it was the Quaker nurses that had taught him English for the first time. And if you read his writings, his, his English is impeccable and, and, and wonderful. And to imagine that uh, he did most of his writing when he was in his 20s and 30s, it's just amazing how well he, he picked up the language. Anyway, so that's another way. People that are interested in, in the history of not only the art, but of Audubon themselves, below the birds in the gallery, where the magazines are located, there's a very carefully selected shelf of reference works also that uh, you can dip, dip into and find all kinds of different things to read about. So, so that's sort of the background. I had to propose to the library that they accept this project, and yet I didn't have much time because I wanted, if they did accept it, I wanted to have it all ready by the centennial, which was only three or four months away. And it seemed almost impossible to be able to acquire all that material, get it properly framed in terms of museum quality materials, find somebody to hang it, put up the electric, electric lights and so forth. So I bit the bullet and uh, decided to start acquiring the art before I had any permission to, or any agreement that they would actually accept the gallery. Art, Audubon art is extremely rare. And if something comes along, you need to get it right away. So I had to spend a lot of my budget on this before I knew whether I would be able to use it or not. I didn't want it for my own home. I had no other use for it. So I, I just crossed my fingers and assumed that the library would recognize what a wonderful idea it, this was that they would eventually accept it. And they, they finally did, which was a big relief to me. But so in, in basically, by the time I first talked to uh, Kirsten Spina in June, basically only about four months, four and a half months between that moment 
and the installation in time for the uh, bicent the centennial event in October 17th, which I think is pretty amazing. So I was very happy to have that behind me. But that's one reason why I'm still somewhat <laughs> ignorant about a lot, a lot of things about Audubon. I haven't had time to dig into to a lot of these things that we're talking about. Um, some of the specifics that I think you would find interesting are the, there's a little information about each of the additions that I wanted to have represented. Ideally, I knew I had room for about 16 to 18 prints. You've seen them out there as you came in probably, you know, they're all big, they're sort of, when you frame them, they're something like three by four foot. And, uh, <coughs> But I also wanted, there, there was about five different kinds of editions or five specific editions that I wanted represented, so I wanted to try and get them balanced as much as possible. Um, I should mention that the, well, let me say a little bit about the first edition. Uh, Audubon was born in 1785, so he came to the United States in about 1803. <coughs> He, he tried various mercantile and other kinds of activities. He tried being an artist and traveled around and painted people's portraits. He made most of his portraits painting pictures of people in their coffins. Deathbed portraits were very popular back then. This was before photography, you know, so it was a good way to, to, write, to uh, memorialize someone. But he was always attracted to nature and to birds, and he spent all of his time doing that. And eventually he, he failed in various <coughs> Uh, business type activities. But he was always happy to do that because it gave him more of an excuse to go out and just look for birds. He also had some setbacks in that area. When he decided to devote his life to the study of birds, um, and, ha and had done so for a number of years, he went back home at once after a bird trip and discovered that uh, rats had eaten up 200 of the pictures that he had been painting for the previous five years, so he had to start all over again. And this was in Kentucky. He started out, his father was very rich from Haiti as a, as a slave owner and a privateer. And when things got tough there, the father bought a, a plantation near Philadelphia called Mill Grove, which even today is sort of a, an Audubon Museum site. And uh, so Audubon grew up uh, in France in a very wealthy family his father went back to France because of the problems in Haiti, and then he came over and he lived the life of a wealthy person in, in America, too. But uh, again, his, he was always a maverick. He wanted to be out there painting the birds. So he conceived the idea of, of a book called Birds of America, in which every single species, known species of bird in America would be represented, and all of them would be painted life-size. So life-size meant that the prints had to be very large. And it also meant that for some of the larger birds, he had to paint them in a somewhat contorted way, like a flamingo with its head down to the <coughs> ground, in order to squeeze them into the space that he had. But the space was, this, the first edition was refer, uh, referred to as the double elephant fo uh, foli uh, folio edition, because double elephant folio talked about the size of the sheets of paper. That was the largest size of sheet of paper that they had at the time. Folio was <coughs> the largest pic, uh, big page we normally think of. Double folio, obviously, is twice that. And then elephant, they made it even bigger. So that's, it goes by the DEF as, a, as the uh, abbreviation for that. And this edition was extremely expensive for the time. It sold for $1,000 per copy, which was 435 plates um, bound in, and usually bound in four, uh, four volumes, although people could choose how many volumes they wanted to bind it in. Now, $1,000 back then would be the equivalent of about a half million dollar home in Casanova now, to give you an idea of what the cost was. So most of the people that were buying it were mon monarchs, nobility, uh, rich financiers and businessmen and so forth. This, this was not an addition for people like, like most of us. So one, of you, one of you fall in that category, then you could have been able to buy one. In, in 2010, a copy went on the market, they're very rare, and it sold for ten and a half million dollars. They only published, figures are a little vague on all this, but they only published 
between 180 and 191 copies of the book, but that was still enough to make millions and millions of dollars <laughs> in, in, in our today's currency. 120 of those books are known to exist in various institutes around the world, museums, famous libraries, British li Library, and so forth, which means that uh, at the most, there were only 70 other copies floating around, sort of free, not already claimed by some institution forever. And so many of those have been lost, burned, broken up in various ways. So we can assume that for any of the prints you see out there from that first edition, there's probably no more than, at absolute most, 50 of them existing in the world that might ever come on the market, which is why I said earlier that they're very rare. Now, the three that are, um, there are three from that edition in this exhibit. I wanted to have four, but uh, they just weren't available. <laughs> so, uh, and so I'll just very quickly tell you what they are, and we'll look at them more closely when we go out there. Uh, one of them is the Baltimore Oriole, and um, a second one is the Red Winged Starling, and then the third is a Red Eyed uh, Vireo. If you if you've been looking at the uh, exhibit already, you'll know maybe which those pictures are. The red-eyed vireo is a single bird out there, looking up at a spider web with a spider in the middle of it, looking at a future snack. I I I was happy. I don't know whether that's really one of the top 30 ones. It might be a little dumb. one of the only ones which isn't. But I wanted to get it because I thought children would enjoy spotting the the, the spider hanging there in the corner of the library. Um, these were all printed, and I'm using up too much of my time, so I won't go into a lot of detail. Audubon could not find, for various reasons, anybody in the United States to print this book for him. Now, a lot of people were jealous of him in, this, in these scientific organizations. They thought he was too rough, not, didn't have the right credentials, and so forth. So he went to Europe, and the Europeans fell all over him. As I said, they called him the American Woodsman. And he, he found a printer in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, and started the work there, but he wasn't satisfied with it after about 10 plates. So then he found another uh, printer named either Havel or Havel, I've never figured it out, I keep looking it up on the internet, nobody tells me how to pronounce it, who did all the rest of the work in one. And most of the books were probably actually sold in Europe at the time, because there was a long tradition in Europe of interest in botanical books, bird books, animal books, and so forth. Um, in any event, he started publishing these in, in the prints in 1828 and finished in about 1839. It took 11 years just to publish the prints. And the process was not to publish them all and put them in four volumes and send them out to everybody. It took too long to publish the book. So they divided it up into little fascicles. Each, if you, you would take a subscription and you would get one large plate, uh, two medium-sized plates. They were all on the same size sheets of paper, but you get one large bird, two medium birds, and then three smaller birds, like sparrows and finches and things like that. And those would be sent out every five or six weeks over this 11-year period. People would save them up, and when they got enough, they would have one volume maybe uh, put together with a leather binding and that sort of thing. So it was a very complicated uh, process the printing process was complicated. I, I don't still understand myself all the details of how prints are made, but I can tell you that they had, for a print like this, they had 50 colorists working full time to make, make the prints. They're all hand colored. And um, so it was, a, it was an enormous but an extremely successful uh, achievement. And you'll be able to look at those prints. And the amazing thing is the prints that I was able to acquire look just as fresh and new as, as any you could imagine from any of the editions, or even up to the, to the present day, as you'll see. So it's amazing. Um, that edition was so successful that it made Audubon famous. But he felt bad because it excluded the general public. Nobody could afford it except the very rich. So he planned a new edition, which is called the Royal Octavo Edition. Octavo, like the word folio, relates to sort of the size of a page of a book. An octavo is eight parts of a folio, to give you an idea. 
And they came up, they had a new invention at the time called the camera lucida, the lucid camera, where you could point that camera at a big picture and it would make a reproduction in one eighth size in, in, on the tabletop and then they could lay a sheet of paper over that and sort of redo the etching down to one eighth size. So that, and on the one hand, the exactness of the copies of the birds is amazing. On the other hand, because the pictures were smaller, they redid a lot of the landscaping in the background and so forth because it would have looked much too cluttered for or a smaller print. So it's interesting to when you see the three prints of the swans out in the gallery, to look right next to them, you'll see the three little ones, and you can see that, in fact, the background is, is, is quite different sometimes than those. Um, I should, what I should say about the print process, though, is uh, that what Audubon did was to paint watercolors of birds. Just, and so for the 435 prints that he has, they're mostly based on the original watercolors that he did. Although at the end they started combining some of the watercolors because the, it was getting too expensive for the people to continue their subscriptions. Uh, so what you see when you look at Audubon's prints are not his original works. The works are works done by engravers copying his original watercolors and then other artists adding, usually adding in a considerable amount of background. He would paint the birds, but he didn't bother painting all the plants and other little critters, and, and maybe there's an occasional background of a cityscape and things like that. So it really was a, a, a project that involved much more than just Audubon himself, but he always felt that it was the prince that was his, his, his art achievement, not the watercolor. So he wasn't concerned so much with the watercolor. All the watercolors are, are preserved today in the New York Historical Society in Manhattan. So if you really want to see something a little different, and they've all been recently reproduced, so that, uh, you, can, you can see them that way too. But when we talk about Audubon art, we're not talking about the prints, I mean the, the, the watercolors, we're talking about the prints, because there are differences in them. Yeah. I'll give you one interesting example of that. One of the prints from the next edition that I'm going to talk about is out there of the uh, yellow-breasted chat. I'll, I'll pass this around so all of you can see this. It's from an edition that dates to about 1860. And I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But the interesting thing is that Audubon always was sensitive to the reaction of his customers. And his watercolor, this is his copy of his watercolor of the red, of the yellow-breasted chat. And it has a bird in a nest, female in a nest, another male perhaps bringing some food to the nest, and three more males up above sort of in different patterns of, of flight. And the public, when they saw this watercolor, said, that's not realistic. You're not being a good naturalist here. <laughs> Birds don't act like that. There's a little bird, he's got his wings out like this, his little feet sticking straight out and just really showing off, in fact. And they said, that's not an authentic picture. So he said, okay, and when they did the engraving, they removed this bird from, from the picture. So when you see it out in the gallery, you'll see these two birds and the other two birds down here, but you won't see the fifth bird at all. And the, it sort of gets cut off a little bit also just to make it balanced. But Audubon himself, at the same time, tried to justify what he had done. So when he did omit the bird, he still wrote a text about the bird saying, uh, about his field observations, the bird, referring to the one he removed, mounts in the air, this is just from when he sees them out in, in the field, the bird mounts in the air in various attitudes with its legs and feet hanging while it continues its song and jerks its body with great vehemence, performing the strangest and most whimsical gesticulations. So, so that we lost that one in, in print, but the, it's an interesting way to show you how what goes into the creation of each one of, one of these. So I talked about the first edition and the second edition, which is the smaller prints. Um, the Audubon had two sons. They wanted to do a third edition. No, let me back up. That's right. Um, this, I didn't tell you, the first edition was done between 1826 and 1830. 
eight or nine, approximately. The, you might catch me with my numbers slightly off, but the, then the, the smaller version was about nine, 1839 to 1845. Then Audubon died in, in 1851. He was 66 years old and he'd been suffering from Alzheimer's disease for the last three or four years of his life. But his sons wanted to do another big edition. Um, and his sons had been working with him on these other editions in various ways from the, from the beginning. So they planned an, an edition, a larger folio size, same, same size paper as this, that they started working on in 1859. And they only got about a third into the, uh, into the edition when all the problems of the American Civil War caught up with them, <laughs> nobody had any time for birds or had any money to buy any of this stuff. And so the Audubon family went completely bankrupt. And consequently, only about 150 of the 435 plates were, were redone. And fewer numbers of each of those plates was done than in the first edition. So that third edition is really much rarer than the first edition. The reason it's interesting is they used the same plates, but instead of using hand coloring, uh, we were now getting into the Industrial Revolution and so forth, uh, there was a brand new technique called chromolithography, which is used a lot later on, but this was right at the beginning of chromolithography, and so the, the Audubon family decided to do this third edition using chromolithography, which basically meant that instead of engraving on a plate and then hand coloring, they did something like modern lithography, where you have to do one layer of color and then another layer of color and another layer. Um, but, uh, but their process was mechanized more than traditional lithography, so it was, it was faster to do. And then on top of that, they still did a lot of hand coloring to make sure that it stayed to the same high quality. So four works from that edition are out in the gallery also, and you'll be able to, that way you can compare those with the ones of the first edition and you'll see that they're equally beautiful. The best example of how wonderful they can be is the pileated woodpeckers, the woodpeckers that are out there, which I think is a wonderful print. Uh, when we walk out, I'll sort of tell you again which, which, which pictures go with which editions and so forth. Then one of the great ironies of the editions with uh, uh, Audubon is on the one hand, all of these plates are extremely rare, and yet, in the history of America, nobody has sold more pictures of birds than Audubon. Millions and millions of bird Audubon prints have been distributed since the late 19th century, all through the early and mid 20th century. They were on every kind of insurance company's calendar and things like that. You know, everybody's had Audubon prints in their house. But the, the kind of Audubon prints you would want to have in a gallery like this, on the other hand, are extremely rare. So it's interesting to see that contrast. Um, the next edition that caught my eye that I felt we needed to have included, uh, it's not the fourth edition, but what it is is um, it's a restrike edition. After the Audubon family went bankrupt, Audubon's widow sold his copper plates, all 435 of them, for scrap. And they were being melted down when a teenage boy walked by and saw what was happening and had some sense that this was valuable. And he went and talked to his mother. And so eventually about 80 of the 435 plates were, were saved. They're now in the American Museum of Natural History in various states of, of preservation. So in, 18, in 1985, the American Museum of Natural History decided to recognize the two 200th anniversary of the birth of Audubon by taking six of those plates and doing what they call a restrike. In other words, using the original plates, but, uh, so it, but it's not exactly the same as the first edition, but it's not different from the first edition either, in a sense. So they used the original plates. They also did complete hand coloring, so you can imagine how expensive that would be in, in, in 1985. And their goal was to make the, the prints better than Audubon had been able to make his own prints, because they knew what his uh, 
goals were, but he had to make various compromises, even when he was selling prints to the kings and the, and the monarchs, that he couldn't do them to quite the highest standards that he wanted to do. And so they decided to apply those standards to these six plates. So they're, they're very, very interesting. And four of those are out in the gallery here. The, the male turkey, the female turkey, the mallards, and the Canada goose. I looked up this morning, that edition was done in 1985, 125 copies, most of, so, of which sold right away to uh, either museums or libraries or Dow Jones, I think, has a set and so forth. But they still have a, a very small number left. You can buy still most of the individual plates. The male turkey, you can only buy now if you buy a full set. And the full set for the six plates is $50,000. Mm -hmm. But if you, buy the, uh, if you bought the turkey earlier, it was $14,000 all by itself, so it's still a bargain to get a whole complete set. <laughs> now, why aren't there, why are there more, no, no more than four out there? It's because of the rule that I was following of local birds, the other two birds in the set you know, weren't local, so I didn't try to acquire them. But then. So, after that, the last pictures, uh, because of 1985 being such an important year, 200th 200, 200 anniversary, a lot, and because a tremendous amount of progress had been made in printing between the 19th century and today with digital digitization and the new G clay techniques and so forth, a lot of people started printing high quality reproductions of, of Audubon prints, mostly being distinguished by the kind of paper they used because they were, they'd gotten to the point where they could pretty much duplicate what Audubon had done back then. So there's one example of that in the gallery it was done in maybe 2005 by a, a small printer who had a plan to do 12 or 15, and he only did one, and then he stopped. And I think the reason he stopped is even after 2005, they kept making more improvements, but they were able to, to lower the prices at the same time. So why would somebody want to pay $2,500 for a print from him when now, 10 years later, you can get the same print, same quality, or even better? or $350, But I thought that was still interesting to have one example of what was going on, because there were a lot of these small printers between 1985 and 2005 or so that were doing these small sort of custom-made editions. The final prints in the gallery that are reproductions are the three swans, and there's two reasons for that. The swans are among the most popular pictures in, in the Audubon corpus, to get an original large size one, you can't go to the Civil War edition because they didn't print that one. Their edition was truncated by the war before then. So the only big ones come from the first edition. We've talked about how rare they are. A typical uh, Audubon Swan print today would sell for at least $300,000, possibly more, depending on the condition. So it would not be appropriate, no matter if somebody wanted to volunteer to donate those to the library, it wouldn't be appropriate for the library to take on such a, a major uh, concern in terms of security and, and insurance costs and things like that. So it made sense to buy those in the, in the reproduced form. And the company that I use is a company that has a, a relationship with one of the most famous museums in the Netherlands, which has a tradition of going back and buying all these botanical and bird books and uh, nature books way back into the 16th century. And so they have the rights to copy any of the books in that museum with their big fancy um, cameras. And they, their cameras are so amazing now that uh, well, they have nearly 2,900 dots of uh, different color ink possible per square inch of printing to give you an idea how fine. And they can go in and also they can even remove dirt spots and so forth through photoshopping type techniques. And $350 per, per print for that. So, so we run the gamut from prints from way back in the early 19th century that are extremely rare right up to the ones today that any of us could have hanging in our homes. Um, and yet they're all wonderful. But I think it's interesting to know the history of how they, they came about and, and the, the various uh, things that they went through. Anybody have any questions or comments? I should have stopped and asked by now, but uh, I thought maybe you'd just raise your hand. Yes? Did Audubon actually um, kill any of the birds and stuff them to work from? 
Uh, I don't think the word would be any. He killed all of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, there, again, the camera had not been invented yet. And you know how fast birds fly and so forth, no matter how carefully you, uh, you look at them. Uh, what he did do, though, was, unlike previous... Well, Audubon was not the first bird illustrator in America. There was a man named Alexander Wilson who tried to do a similar project just a few years before Audubon did. Uh, but his and, his, and he made a, a very important contribution to science and to art. But in comparison to Audubon's works, his, his birds look very stiff and like, more like they're in museum dioramas in other, rather than out in nature. But uh, he used stuffed birds. Um, Audubon developed a new technique where he would shoot birds and then immediately, while they were still fresh and uh, pliable, he had a, a, a technique of using wires and, and different little uh, joists and hooks and so forth to put them into the different positions that he knew were natural because he'd been observing them so long. But he could, once he got them in that position, then he could take the time to get every feather right, every color right, and so forth. So uh, I only answer that question when somebody asks it because a lot of kids go, ew, <laughs> you know, all these dead birds, but because they look so alive, you know, in the pictures. But uh, and curiously, I'll mention just as a side, uh, after Audubon did his first two editions, and then he pretty much died after that, but he did one other edition in the meantime, right about the same time, a little later than he did the small pictures. And that was all the mammals in the, in the New World, not the new for the birds, but the mammals. And it's, to me, it's not nearly as interesting artistically. I mean, they still have all the mammals there, and even then, they went around to zoos to, to, to copy the mammals rather than make the trips out to unusual places to find them. And they would even go into museums and copy stuffed mammals and stuff. But mainly Audubon's two sons contributed to that book. And you can just see the difference in, in the artistry. And one of the things that's interesting in Audubon is the other big swan picture, if you remember, is um, pretty much the same kind of posture except the swan has a head turned back to here and the swan is looking down at a little moth that's floating in the water. Obviously going to nibble on it in a, in a minute or two. Audubon did not paint that originally. He just painted the swan looking back. It was one of his engravers that suggested we ought to have the swan looking at something. But in general, all the Audubon prints, or many of them, have these little extra features like a bug, a little lizard, a snail, that will attract the attention not only of the birds, but of we viewers. Uh, those kinds of little extras are all missing in the, in the, in the <laughs> mammal selection. It makes it a little less interesting to me to not have all those fun things to watch for. But, uh, so I, and besides, I didn't have another wall in the library. <laughs> so I had to stop at some point. So I don't know, I could talk about a lot of things, but I think most of you probably expected to come for no more than an hour, and I think we really should enjoy 10 minutes or 12 minutes out looking at the art itself. Yes? Is, have you written up, or has the library, any kind of a explanation of what's out there that you've just given us verbally? It's very interesting. I had no idea it was. I'm supposed to be doing that. Uh, <laughs> and the library, I'm on there. Should have had a tape report. I'm on there negative list for the library, but I've been involved in another big project that's quite different. I'm going to be preparing a kind of a, a loose leaf folder where things like this will be in there with uh, different things to read, and it will talk a, a little bit about, I'm not going to write it so much as download it from here and there on the internet, but at least try and do, this, as you say, a little bit about Audubon, a little bit about the different uh, editions, maybe something interesting about each bird and so on. But, and I also want to recognize a number of dealers gave me some nice discounts and other moral support. Some of them contributed some of the books that are out there in the, in the bookshelf, so I want to be sure everybody gets their, their recognition that will be in that book, too. By, by the summer, I'll have it done. And then the library could copy it and sell them? Well, they wouldn't do that. They, they're going to leave it out on that main table in the reading room there where there's one book opened up of, of yeah. pictures, I think. The other thing, I'll, I'll just give do a plug on what I am doing now to show you that uh, there's more than Audubon in the world. I've been working on a, an exhibition that's going to be in the rare book section of the Syracuse University Library. 
It's going to open on April 22nd and it'll be there for six months. It's got a fascinating theme. It's, uh, the topic is about in the mid-50s to the early 60s, Salvador Dali was working mainly in Paris with a particular publisher named Joseph Faure. Joseph Faure had got on this kick where he wanted to publish the most expensive books in the world. And he actually, over time, over a period of about eight or nine years, did publish 12 or 13, depending on where you draw the line, of the most expensive art books in the world. The three most expensive uh, were all closely connected to Salvador Dali. And uh, years earlier, Dali got to be known negatively for being interested only in getting a lot of money for his art. So it was some question whether he was really a true artist or whether he was a sort of a, a shyster just trying to milk everybody. So the head of the surrealist movement, André Breton, in, in the early 40s, took Salvador Dali's name and made it into an anagram. You know how you take the letters and just shift them around. And, he, and the anagram was Avida Dollars. And it was greedy, greedy for dollars. So my exhibit is, and, and of course I sort of put Joseph Faure into that category too, so my exhibit is going to be Avida Dollars, colon, Salvador Dali, Joseph Faure, and the three most expensive books in the world. So you're all invited to come and see that. It's going to be a fabulous uh, exhibit. So with that, yes? When I was a kid, we had a neighbor, and you'd walk into his apartment. He had maybe dozens and dozens and dozens of birds flying all over the place and in cages. It was an absolutely incredible, something I'll never forget. It was a wonderful thing. It was a wonderful thing. And uh, I often wondered why he did I just like birds. That was his answer, he liked birds. I think that's the same thing Audubon would say. He was just crazy about birds. So that may be a good way to stop. Any of you who have the time and want to come out and look at some of the pictures with me, I'm sure you'll find it worthwhile. Those of you who've already seen them, maybe not.